I am Adam Butler, the Chief Investment Officer of Resolve Asset Management. I have with me today, David M. Burns, the author of a new book. David, what's your book called? It's Modern Asset Allocation for Wealth Management. Excellent. And uh, just for the benefit of listeners, maybe you go through what you do for your day job and maybe how it relates to your motivation for writing this book. Sure. Um, well, I am the CEO of PortfolioDesigner.com, which is the software that uh, was built for users and readers of the book. Um, but more importantly, now I am the CIO at Simplify Asset Management, uh, which is an asset manager that is advising Simplify ETFs. And we just launched our our first three ETFs about a week ago on NYSE. And uh, yeah, exciting times. Very interesting. So um, which came first, the software or the investment practice? Yeah, so the, the book and the accompanying software came from my background in asset allocation. So I started my career after being a physicist in quantum computation, which is another whole lifetime ago. Um, I went into asset allocation in the wealth management space, focused on quantitative solutions, building out asset allocation systems for advisors. Um, and I did that for seven years at a wealth management firm called Athena Capital Advisors. Great shop. We were managing around five billion uh, when I was there uh, across liquid and illiquid asset classes. And my job there was really to focus on building a, a framework for asset allocation for the advisors to use for the clients there. And and that that's really sort of how this book started. Basically, the the book was sort of a look back on what I had built. Uh, over the seven years at Athena and what I, I thought maybe we could potentially build over the next 10, 20 years and, and what the future of wealth management can hold in, in the realm of asset allocation. Okay. So your um, current firm, so you're currently at Simplify Asset Management. Is that an advisory firm, an asset management firm, both? I mean, obviously you just launched some, some ETFs. So you're, you're definitely in the yeah, asset right. management space, but are you also in the advisory space? No, we're just focused on on the ETF complex. So we just have our, our first three just just came out. We just listed a handful more in some new uh, uh, prospectuses that we just filed. And so, uh, yeah, we have a lot of exciting things come down the pipeline with Simplify. So what are the themes of the ETFs and, and do they map to the themes in the book? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's definitely a connection between the book um, and the ETF company. I think if you know in the book one of the core principles is going beyond sort of the the standard mean variance approach and considering things like loss aversion and and so when you when you do that it naturally begs the question are there products that you can use to help build portfolios that can can handle these sort of non-linearities and, and asymmetric preferences so it's you know, the book is focused on the asset allocation machinery on how to how to account for asymmetric preferences. But if you look, there aren't a lot of uh, investable assets. There aren't a lot of building blocks you can deploy to actually build portfolios of very asymmetric preferences. So yeah, the so ETFs then are we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit in your book, yeah. which, by the way, I thought was great. Um, so one of the chapters in your book is is focused on selecting um, a, a coherent investment universe, which, which is sufficiently large. So as a, as to capture all of the orthogonal dimensions of risk and return, but, um, reduced to the point where there is a minimal amount of overlap between the right. different bets in the portfolio. So the ETFs that you just launched, are they meant to be these sort of orthogonal constituents? to a they, portfolio they, they they are our first suite of products uh it's it's they're labeled convexity u.s equity convexity products and what we're trying to do there really is uh go from a normal distribution of an equity risk premium or, or relatively normally distributed equity risk premium and s p 500 is our our core equity premium benchmark that we're using at simplify and we're trying to say can we modify the moments of the distribution to create something that is pretty orthogonal to the core risk premium. So uh, kind of what you would expect out of alternative risk premia, 
uh, where you're, you're taking on higher moments. But uh, at Simplify, we're trying to really preserve the core equity risk premium when we do this. So we're always invested around 98% uh, in, in US equities. And then we have this 2% convexity overlay that's meant to really chop off left tails, add to right tails, and add skew and co-skew and these higher moments while still giving you the core equity premium. So do you want to take a minute and go into how you manufacture that profile? Sure. <clears throat> so we're doing this purely in an option-based, with an option-based overlay. So we start with a 98% investment in a core US equity ETF, you know, low fee, low fit, you know, very efficient, all that. And then we're overlaying. So let's just do the, we have three products. We have product that has, that's trying to, to add convexity on the downside and the upside. It's a symmetric. Um, then we're also, we also have products, a product that is trying to add convexity just on the downside. So trying to cut off the left tails only. And then we have a product that's trying to add to the right tail only, which is our upside convexity product. So let's just take the downside product uh, as an example in terms of how this, what this option overlay would look like. Basically, we start by saying, what do drawdowns generally look like in markets and how can options be used to help mitigate them? And so we, we basically do a clustering analysis of what drawdowns look like. And we've identified two horizons and magnitudes of, of drawdowns in history that are most common. And then we're buying really deep out of the money puts that'll help hedge against those types of market drawdowns. And then we have a bunch of um, strategy components that help really effectively create those modified distributions We'll monetize options early. Uh, we'll roll them before expiry. So there's there's a lot of components that go into the strategy that really help cre effectively uh, create those modified distributions. So we we're really thinking of options as like surgical blades, where we're trying to take you know a core risk premium that everyone loves and knows, and and we're trying to carve up the return distribution and take weight out in certain places and then add it to other places. So are you options. selling options and to, to fund the purchase of other options or are you expecting um, there to be a general sort of rolling cost in terms of the purchase of right. option premia in order to fund the, the these different distributions? Exactly. We're not selling any options. We're not capping upside or capping any direction. We're just, we're, we're, we're spending a set 2% annual budget on these on the entire overlay gotcha and so when you're talking about the symmetric product we're spending one percent a year on both sides and if you're talking about just the downside or the upside we put the entire two percent into the option overlay uh, for the one side and so um yeah as long as as long as the math works out that you know the amount you're spending you can add enough value during those extreme moments when when convexity is really valuable then then you should be in good shape. Okay, well, that actually leads really nicely, I think, into the theme of your book, which um, I think, uh, if I could kind of summarize it, you're asserting that typical mean variance optimization assumes that investors have exclusively mean and variance preferences. So on the risk side, we're only concerned about volatility. And um, what you've acknowledged explicitly with your model is the findings from behavioral um, behavioral economics and specifically prospect theory. So Kahn Kahneman, Tversky, um, and their acknowledgement that investors are more sensitive to downside risk than upside risk. And that they also exhibit this property, this behavioral property or characteristic called reflexivity or no re reflection rather reflection. reflection yeah. Right. And, um, so the utility function needs to account for both for, for all three of variants, uh, a, a preference away from downside risk and um, this ref the potentially this reflective risk as well, right? Um, so that's a core theme of your book. I know there's other there's other things to it, but I think that relates directly to maybe how you've manufactured this lineup of ETFs. So why don't you go into how yeah. you think about the 
um, this utility maximization problem. Yeah. So, well, before I forget, you're exactly right. Um, I think if you really ask the question of, of, of what are human beings preferences, then this sort of, you know, mean variance, um, rational investor, which, you know, the utility function for that was created in the early 1900s and economists just ran with it. Um, it doesn't really represent human beings well. Uh, and, and so we, we know that that well now. And so right when you get into that, you, you, you really start to yeah, quickly beg the question of um, where are the investment products, right? You can, you can build the asset allocation framework, but should we be focusing on investment products that can more directly speak to these asymmetric preferences? So spot on on that. So, um, well, I guess let's roll back to kind of like the, 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 the very beginning of the book, um, which is ans asking the question, how do you build, what does it mean to build a portfolio for someone, an investment portfolio for someone? You know, how do you, how do you take someone's brain and soul and whatever and, and say, this is the right portfolio of investment holdings for you? And, you know, to our best knowledge, the way to do that is to define a utility function for a human being and then try to maximize that utility. So um, I don't know if that's the best thing to do. I don't know if that's going to be around in 500 years from now, but sort of to the best of our knowledge today in, in economics, that's, that's how you map um, a person to an investment portfolio. And the core um, way that we operate today in wealth management is we really don't account for the two dimensions of the utility function that prospect theory has, the reflection and the loss aversion, we really just have that, that singular risk aversion parameter. Um, and the whole industry uh, runs off of that and, and people are sort of binned into risk tolerance bins and you know there might be four or five portfolios that a firm offers and you're just sort of slogged into one. Um, but we know humans aren't, aren't like that. And so the, the first thing to going from A to Z to build a portfolio for someone is to say, you know, what is your utility function? That's like the first, the first step. And then, like you said, there's a bunch of other steps we have to go through, but that's, that's the starting point. And there's also a huge topic of how do you actually measure the three parameters, right? I think everyone is very familiar with how you measure. Well, let me rephrase that. Everyone is familiar with sort of how people measure your risk tolerance today, but I would challenge that the way that's done is probably has massive error bars on it. And I don't, I don't think that there's been nearly enough research into that. And, you know, I think ask your neighbor, ask anyone um, if they filled out a, a risk tolerance questionnaire at their broker and they'll, they'll generally get the same answer, which is, uh, yeah, I, I was asked a couple questions. Do, you know, am I scared of losing money or, you know, do I like uh, gambling? And um, from my perspective, being a scientist, it's really hard to imagine how that's like a, a real sort of um, medical grade test. So I, I think there's two really important things to, to consider here that the book is trying to take a step forward on, which is um, what is the starting utility function we should consider? How many parameters are in, are in it? And then how do we, how do we measure it? Um, and, and yeah, the, the world is, is, is there's a ton of loss aversion in the world. And when we don't correctly account for it, we'll build, uh, portfolios that are not appropriate for people. You know, think about 2008, think about the stories of people who, uh, went to cash in 2008 and didn't get back invested into equities for five, six, seven years. Um, we've all heard the stories and I think, uh, really what you're seeing there is that people's loss aversion was mis misdiagnosed and they got incredibly scarred um, and they would have been way better off having a proper diagnosis of loss aversion, having their equity allocation probably dialed back from 60 to 30% or 40%. And then they would have stayed in and they would have done a lot better. Right. So <clears throat> uh, I think it'd be helpful. And I was actually trying to log in to, to see if I could, I could show the chart from your book, but I think it would be helpful to sort of describe um, a typical, I found the chart in your book to be helpful in understanding these concepts, right? So a typical utility curve is shaped 
sort of like a parabola because the idea is that an investor's the marginal utility of an extra dollar of wealth declines as an investor's wealth increases, right? So if you offer an investor who's a multimillionaire the opportunity to to play a lottery for $10 or $1,000, he the value of that extra $1,000 is less to that multimillionaire than it would be to somebody who lives below the poverty line, right? Um, so you've got this sort of diminishing return on extra wealth. And what I what I found interesting in the chart that you showed was when you introduced this idea of loss aversion, when the potential for um, for for losing wealth is introduced, or, or or the part of the curve where you're losing wealth, that that the utility drops off very very steeply, um, much more steeply than for a normal um, log utility curve, right? And and then for this reflective quality, I guess the the curve almost has a bit of an S shape, S right? S shape. Yeah. So, so what is I think that it's it's the, the loss aversion parameters, I think, a little bit more easy to, to comprehend visually yeah. and, and internalize. The, the reflective one, I think, would requires a little more explanation. So maybe maybe pull on that thread a little bit. Yeah, this is like um, kind of like a like a fear of missing out type of behavior. And it'll actually put you into higher risk portfolios. And, you know, I think the easiest way for me to think about it is let's say you have a, uh, an asset, you know, um, in your portfolio that's like down 30%, you know, do you want to kind of stick with it and roll the dice and this thing could go down, you know, could be cut in half from there, or do you want to kind of roll the dice and see, see if you can get back to even or, or even better. So, um, I, I think, you know, holding on to losers, uh, you know, we're all, we're all told to cut losers and hold on to winners. And this is the opposite, right? And this is what, what a lot of people do demonstrate. They, they hold on to losers, hoping to get, get back to even, or still, or still be proven correct. Right. Uh, so that, that's, that's exactly what that, that risk seeking behavior is in the loss domain. Right. So I, yeah. I thought that was all very intuitive and I thought it was neat how you incorporated directly the, um, the findings from behavioral economics. One thing I was curious about, I mean, having worked with clients for many years directly, one thing that we noticed, because we've always been focused on mean variance optimization and, and perhaps overly myopic on that objective um, from a practice standpoint, but um, one thing we've especially noticed is that investors are also very attuned to what the market is doing, right? So we've always contemplated, and I know um, Corey Hofstein, for example, has done some work on this on on the Weird portfolio, which jointly optimizes to mean variance optimize or mean variance utility, but then also optimizes to um, mean tracking error utility against, for example, the S and P or uh, the U.S. sixty forty portfolio. Did you did you contemplate this, or is this something that you've obviously observed in the literature, the way we have um, experienced directly with clients, and, and is this something that you contemplated, including with your model? It, if not, or if so, why? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't. Um, I guess I just didn't find the right. And and to be fair, it's not something I've sort of looked at exactly. So. Um, but I, I guess sort of falling out of the academic literature and sort of the process I went through to try to put together this sort of best practice workflow from end to end, um, it, it didn't fall out to me uh, as sort of the path I, I wanted to take to, to manage clients. So um, for better or worse, I was probably going through sort of an overly pedantic and potentially a bit academic of an exercise to create this sort of end to end workflow. And so um, that's why it probably smells like that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I, again, it was it was it was intuitive, and I appreciated the connection to behavioral economics. And um, I, I also think that it would have been interesting to explore adding an extra dimension to the optimization to account for um, sensitivity to to tracking error aversion, like just adding an extra term, 
And um, to your point, then you can probably measure this using similar type of lottery oriented questions to capture the beta of a of an investor's utility curve to that specific dynamic as well, right? Which dovetails nicely into um, it's like another it's like another dimension of behavior, I think. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Like, and, and it's you're like, let's go from three to four parameters, Dave. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 shockingly important though, you know, and I I, I agree, obviously moving into more and more parameters the you get into dimensionality challenges with the amount of data you have. And I mean, there's lots of, exactly. there's lots of issues on, on all sides, but this has been I an especially it. interesting uh, observation for us as, you know, people who've worked directly with clients over the years and we run mostly uh, strategies that are not really oriented towards traditional portfolios. So this has been acutely urgently in our, um, in our site so for, you for be more sensitive to it. Yes. Right. You see, you might be more sensitive to it. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. For sure. For sure. But yeah. either way, I think it's, it's, um, I was really enamored also with the way that you try to attack measuring a person's, uh, risk preferences using the lottery based, uh, surveys. Maybe you go into that. What was your thinking on that and how do they work? Yeah, I think, um, you know, intuitively, uh, these sort of, you know, Grable Litton-esque questions that the industry has just grossly adopted over the last two decades, um, which seem very um, qualitative and, and there's a sort of a lot of self-diagnostics in there. They just didn't really hit me as very, um, as really having the potential of being very accurate. And at the same time, I think the way people have uh, aggregated different questions and just sort of squish them together in terms of, you know, let's say you answer four questions on risk tolerance. If you flag as a four out of four on each one, you add it up to 16. And just just adding up a series of questions also doesn't seem like sort of a very rigorous um, kind of aggregation system, especially if there's like multiple dimensions in there. So if you look carefully at the risk preference diagnostic literature for these like Grable Litton type questions, they actually have loss aversion questions in the list buried and they identify them as such. But as you know, since loss aversion makes the utility function fall off, it can make it fall off a cliff really aggressively, way faster than risk aversion can. Then if you have 10 questions on a list and two are about loss aversion and you flag as very loss averse, well, that's just two out of 10. So it's only going to maybe bring down your like effective risk aversion by like 20%, but yet we know the utility function can be like triple as low. Mm. So there's, there's also this really obvious aggregation challenge in the industry uh, with these types of questions. So the only way I could see um, from the literature to do this accurately is to diagnose each parameter very independently uh, and really try to specifically uh, diagnose each parameter and these lottery style questions are are out there and you can map each one of these questionnaires to a, sp a very specific parameter so i know that i'm not just kind of taking like a, a, a like a fluffy question about diagnosing your own risk and then having to map it somehow qualitatively again so two qualitative st steps uh, to a parameter i actually have this thing that is incredibly precise as long as i can solicit the, the response properly from someone in a good state of mind. I mean, there, there's, there's plenty of other error that can come in, but at least I know that um, if you switch, you know, on the, like for instance, on the loss aversion questionnaire, if you're willing to take a bet that's a two to one payoff, but not one that is 1.5 to one, then I know your loss aversion is two to one. It's just the ratio of those two things. It's very mathematical. Right. Um, so that was also really attractive. So independently, independently measuring them, and then also trying to use a questionnaire that that is at least trying to be accurate from the start. Yeah, no, I thought that was really intuitive. Um, and you do discuss at length, and I think very thoughtfully, the, this idea of the validity of a, of a test, right? And um, and I think you acknowledged explicitly, and I, I'd just be interested in your in your in your take on this, but. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why traditional surveys are not very effective is that A, they don't measure explicitly the, the, the right dimensions of risk, but also because 
investors are not very good at conceptualizing or identifying their true trigger emotional triggers you know like you you ask a person in a calm emotional state to evaluate how they were will feel when they're on tilt and those don't off i mean in, in my experience they just don't map very well in in many cases and i, I know that your uh, your attempt at this doesn't make that any worse like there's no there's nothing about your method that is that is any worse at capturing that than any other method that is just an omnipresent challenge do you feel that your approach closes the gap though in a way that some of the more um prosaic surveys don't i i hope so uh that's definitely one of the hopes and i'm, I'm working closely um with a psychometric testing firm uh, and, and I, I did sort of throughout the book, we, we've um, surveyed the questionnaires and we've done a, a lot of data work on that. And, and we're going to be publishing that soon. Uh, the psychometric testing company is called ACS Ventures uh, and their expertise is on reliability, validity and, and studying these things. And so we'll be releasing some data and analysis on that soon. And I, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job and we stack it against Grable, the in type questions and everything. So. Uh, I think we'll have some exciting news to share on that front. So how do they measure that? I'm curious. I mean, uh, I'm not sure just how deeply you've been involved with with what they do, but I mean, I would expect that they would measure people's response to these surveys and then observe their behavior in different market conditions and, and see how well their responses map to their behavior in, in these conditions, or is there another method that they use? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a bunch of ways to do it, which I think is a whole nother podcast. Um, and, and it goes off the, the deep end a bit quickly. Uh, but, you know, the, the thing I'll bring up on this that I, I think is, is overwhelmingly interesting um, is that I don't know if you saw, you probably saw this part of the book. Um, and this is sort of, I think, is an interesting challenge to the whole industry is the, the, the part where I went through how when you uh, give one of these questionnaires with small amounts of money and fake dollars, how you're not soliciting accurate uh, results, answers, but then if you scale those numbers way up, but they're still fake, you're, you're still not soliciting accurate results. But then if they're real dollars and very large, then all of a sudden the answers change and you start to get more real, uh, uh, answers and accurate answers. And so it, it's, I, I find this really funny and, but very interesting, you know, uh, the, the way you should do your first meeting with your client is you, you know, snap your fingers and their bank accounts on the table. And then you snap your fingers and your bank accounts on the table and you say, look, to do this well, somebody's going to lose money right now, but we're going to go through these questionnaires, but this is as real as it gets. <laughs> so that's literally um, the only way to actually get the get close to a person's true risk preferences. And even then, it assumes that risk preferences are stationary in time, right? Like uh, that people don't get more or less risk averse in different market right. conditions or different phases of their life or, or what have you, right? So, and I think you did a good job of, of suggesting that advisors should be administering these tests to clients regularly so that, yeah. you know, they can yeah. sort of triangulate the true preferences over time. Minimally, yeah, mi minimally over sort of, you know, big market around big market events, um, big life events, you know, per personal events can really change things. So I, I think as long as you, as long as you try to administer it sort of around those big events, um, you'll be in pretty good shape. And, and a lot of it is, is, is also educational for them just to be able to say, hey, look, all of my clients loss aversion went up 50% over the last right. two months. You're not. Right different. Here's a chart of my whole client base. And, you know, that's, that's incredibly uh, interesting education. And, and, and also just on the three different parameters, educating clients on loss aversion, for instance, I think that also is uh, something that's, that can be really educational for clients. And um, thus far, what I've seen from advisors who have, have used the software and have deployed this with, with clients, um, I think clients really feel like the advisor 
is getting to know them a lot better and is and and the client is seeing a window into the advisor sort of caring and really getting involved and the advisor explaining things to them so um you know for instance a story i like to tell on this front is um i was doing a demo with some advisors and we did we 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 measured everyone's loss aversion and then we had everyone take the the their phones out of their pocket and look at their cell phone cases and it was a really nice correlation between um, you know, the highly loss averse people had these very large cases on their phones. And then the guy that had like absolutely no loss aversion, maybe even the opposite somehow. No case. He had two iPhones with no cases on yeah. them. So, you know, work in the personal no case. Um, and, and so when you start to tie these parameters into real life, and and you and, and the advisor really gets to understand what these parameters are and they can make those parallels and and clients can start to see how they exhibit loss aversion in their everyday life you know do you how much insurance do you take out uh for x y or z and what's the what's the you know what's the the national average and where you know um there's a lot of really interesting content and it it, it really empowers the advisor and the client to to really engage the portfolio i think in a more meaningful way I agree. And I think you acknowledge that this may be the most important feature of the approach that you advocate, this idea that you are you are able to have deeper, more informed, more educational conversations with clients. And, they, and the client genuinely feels like you're getting to know them and they're not just getting bucketed as, you know, there's, there's, there's three kinds of snowflakes, your snowflake A, right? Yeah. Um, but rather you're really getting a sense of their unique snowflake characteristics and um, are able to map those qualities to other decisions that they make in their life. And that crystallizes the concept for them, um, I think yeah. in a way that you aren't able to do using other techniques. So I, I think that's a, that's a great quality to this. Yeah. And like, you know, I think another interesting thing on this topic is, is I'm going to give a shout out to a company, you know, Risk Allies, which I'm sure you've heard of, yep. you know, they have this single risk number. And so you might sort of intuitively say, okay, they're, they're kind of like everyone else. They just have like a single number and you're somewhere, whatever. But if you look at their questions and how they actually build the number up, um, they're actually using these quantitative questions. And they're actually building out a full utility function. They're asking these questions that sort of help map out the entire utility function. And, but what they do is instead of deconstructing it into a series of parameters, like I do, instead of parameterizing with three parameters, they just fit one function over it. And they just fit it with this, this risk aversion number, a single number. And they parameterize this sort of constant second derivative function with one parameter. Right. But their methodology is very numerate and they have all the underlying data, but they're just deciding not to showcase the underlying data and sort of expose it in this way. So um, it's, it's very intriguing to me sort of how they, they made that business decision to um, have the, the, the deeper power of all these really nice quantitative questions that should be more uh, valid, higher validity but then they sort of hide it to sort of make uh, what they do is they make this effective risk aversion. They have a single parameter that accounts for loss aversion. So if your loss aversion is really steep, they'll just basically kind of increase the risk aversion to help bring this, this curvature in. Right. Um, and and I, I find that to be, to be really interesting, but I, it, it's, it teases, it, it gets to the question of what is best for the client? You know, is it better to expose, these underlying parameters and behaviors or not. And I, you know, my book went one way, but I, as long as we're, we're measuring it right, uh, I think that's a great first step. So, you know, risk is certainly doing that. Um, and then but, being able to communicate those dimensions in an intuitive way to clients though, is an extra layer of value that- um, Yeah, I, I would love to see them say, hey, look, we have this effective number, but if we look at your utility function, you have some really interesting behavior going on under the surface. Let's expose that. Let's educate you on it. Um, I think that could be incredibly cool because I know they have the data. Yep. Um, but then you can take it one step further and say, if there was a firm 
that started to offer higher moment building blocks. And we started to play, get outside of playing and just in volatility land. Now it gets even more deeply interesting to have some of those parameters uh, really isolated because an effective risk aversion won't really be enough now. If there's higher moments in the building blocks themselves, having just an effective risk aversion is, isn't good enough. You need those isolated parameters so that in your expected utility optimization, it can really be sensitive to, to those more interesting higher moment building blocks. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. And, and it's, you know, I haven't met anybody who, who doesn't, who isn't interested in learning more about themselves, right? And which is why these personality tests are so popular. And there's all these automated Myers-Briggs type um, yeah. tests online where you get a full report that's automatic, you know, it's it's computer generated, it's formulaic. So a person can 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 fill out a questionnaire. You can imagine a person filling out a riskalyze questionnaire. I think this is where you're going, right? And and not only do does riskalyze get a um, a very granular understanding of their utility function, but they also produce a report that that informs the client about some of the interesting things that maybe they don't know about themselves and they would find very interesting to learn. I think I, that's a really good point. I'll, I'll give you a, a personal example, very dear to me. Um, I was prop trading for a few years and I found out about my loss aversion after the fact. And it was discretionary prop trading. I wish I knew that beforehand. <laughs> so what <laughs> happened? You want to share? It, it made for it. What was that? What happened exactly? Do you want to share? Yeah, no, it, it was, you know, it just, it made for, I was trading, you know, futures, highly levered, uh, very short term, couple days. And my loss aversion was just a constant challenge uh, to, to put on these discretionary trades with a lot of leverage where, um, you know, it was, it was a systematic approach, but you had to stick with the system. Right. But when you have discretion, uh, and you have a lot of loss aversion is the same exact thing we're talking about with the portfolio. It's, it's you have to stick with it and you can't just go to cash and get scared. I wish, I wish I knew about my loss aversion before it, it affected my returns for sure. So yeah, it's, it's, it's and, and as you, future. as you describe in the book, right, it would, if you, if you know this about yourself, you can design an investment strategy that maps to your specific set of different risk preferences, right? And so maybe describe the process that you go through to translate the the three different risk preference parameters and obviously a target return into an optimal portfolio. And I know you, you do this in sort of two chapters in the book and I like the way that you did that where one chapter is, well, we need to, we need to find a parsimonious investment universe right? And then we're going to feed that parsimonious investment universe into our optimizer, because if not, then we're going to optimize on the error term and we get very, very sensitive and fragile results, right? right? So maybe, right. maybe start with how to think about creating a parsimonious investment universe. Yeah. So I, I think the, the first thing to recognize is like we mentioned earlier, we, we need to go beyond mean variance if we really want to properly account for these uh, prospect theory type terms that are, are not, that are going to have higher moment uh, sensitivities. So we're going to do something called returns based optimization. So we're going to maximize the expected utility, but we're going to be bringing in the full return distribution of every asset. And we can see every month we do monthly returns. We can see every month how each asset interacts. Uh, and so that's sort of the first step you need to take to be able to pull this off properly. And then to be able to enable advisors to actually run this mathematical tool, there are two things that we need to help them with. First, we need to minimize the estimation error in our capital market forecasts. Okay. The way the book proposes to do this to first order, just trying to keep it simple for advisors to actually do this at home without a team of PhDs, uh, you know, in their office with them. Uh, we're going to use the last 50 years of historical data. 
and we can get error bars pretty low and we're making a huge assumption. We're making an assumption that the risk premium we're going to invest in for the next 10, 20, 30 years are going to roughly look like the last 50 years. So we're assuming a stationary stochastic process and the moments are going to be consistent. And if you've been earning seven, eight percent by taking on equity risk, that risk premium is going to stay there and still be there. And someone's going to compensate you for taking those risks. So same with the duration, same with all the other risk premia. So we assume those risk premia are, 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 are relatively static and consistent. Uh, and, and, and so by using the 50 years of data, you can have pretty low error bars when you estimate the return distribution to use as your capital market forecast. And then the next thing we need to do to make this optimizer behave well for us and not, not be kooky is that we want to minimize the optimi optimizer sensitivity to estimation error. So there's like two different steps. <clears throat> and the best way to do that is to make sure you don't use assets that are very similar, right? So think about it, you know, an optimizer, an AI, whatever, if you have two very, very similar things, it's just going to fry and not know how to choose between one or the other. Um, but if we only offered very distinct choices, then the sensitivity to estimation error itself is going to be low. So we really want to tackle it uh, on both fronts. And in the book and the software, in terms of, I've talked about the 50 years historical data with low estimation error, the way we avoid co-movement, assets that have a lot of co-movement, um, is we basically build these mimicking portfolios. What you do is, if you have, let's say, six assets in the portfolio that you want to consider for optimization, for each asset, you build a portfolio from all the other assets on the list, not including the one you're interested in, and you build a portfolio that mimics that one asset as much as possible. And if you can build a mimicking portfolio with very low tracking error to that asset, then you don't need that single asset and you can throw it off the list. Because we're not just sensitive to uh, assets that are similar, we're also sensitive to if a whole other list of assets aggregated together in some random way would be similar to a single asset. So it's not just a, a one by one, one versus one question, it's also sort of the rest of the portfolio list if it can replicate a single asset. And so we, uh, you know, yeah, so I go through this tool where you look at the mimicking portfolio tracking error with the rest of your assets and you wanna just, uh, you know, uh, uh, avoid things that have very low mimicking portfolio tracking error. Do I still have you, Adam? Lost you for a second. Keep going. Okay. Y yep. Nope. So you're, you're, yeah, you, so you were saying that um, a cluster of, you want to make sure that you're seeing whether or not a, another asset is additive from an orthogonality standpoint to a to a cluster to, to the rest, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Let's say there's ten assets that you've been taught that are really interesting and compelling and should be in every portfolio. I challenge you to you know put them into my software and look at the mimicking portfolio tracking error and tell me if any of the tracking errors are very low for any of the assets. Um, so you know, I, I think the the classic example that I give in the book is high yield bonds. You know. And it has a lot of duration. They have a lot of duration. There's a lot of sort of equity type credit risk. And so the, the mimicking portfolio tracking error of high yield bonds, when you also have equities and duration in the portfolio, can be really, really low. Mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes less compelling. And even if you can justify it, it's the question of will the optimizer freak out? And so to, to empower people to actually run an optimizer for a given set of risk parameters and a set of assets, we, we just want to avoid those things. So we want to keep it very high level to avoid that craziness. Right. So um, the example you use in the book, for example, is um, you've got a typical mean variance optimization. You've got a market cap weighted stock portfolio and you've got a small value stock portfolio. And because they're so highly correlated, a very small change in expected mean you go from holding 100% cap weighted to 100% small value, right? And so this is obviously 
this is a well-known challenge with with optimization. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, are you familiar with Kritzman's work on, because what's interesting about this, right? Because people talk about optimization being an error maximization process. And that is absolutely true if you, for the reasons that you describe in weight space, right? So the, the weights themselves are extremely fragile. Right, I know, but not not returns wise. Yeah. But the frontier is actually not fragile at all, right? It ends up being virtually identical, even though you're you're completely switching the asset you're holding, the actual mean variance character of the portfolio is very consistent, right? Um, because you're not changing the uh, portfolio character, the inst the uh, individual constituent characteristics very much, right? Yeah. So yeah. There's, that, there's that point. And then the other point is, I know that your, um, your method of identifying whether an asset co-moves with other assets accounts for more than just correlation, right? You're also accounting for coskewness and co-kurtosis, which is right. great. Um, what you're not accounting for, I think, is the difference in means, right? So imagine you've got a, a small value portfolio that has a, a if it has, a, it doesn't really change the the correlation or the co-kurtosis or the co-skewness, but it has a very substantial, it can have a very large difference in mean um, over extended periods. How do you, how do you address that in, in the I optimization? Don't, I, yeah, I don't have a good answer to that. It's a good question. I like it. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. So one way that we've, we've um, yeah. attempted to address that is by just, so, so you've got this, you've got this optimization, right? Which is a returns-based optimization. You're optimizing optimizing to a custom utility function, and so you're finding, using the actual empirical distribution, what combination of assets empirically map most closely to this utility function, right? And so, I guess, well, I and you actually go through a process of resampling in your. Um, in the book. So I was wondering why you didn't just take it that one step further and actually run a bootstrapped optimization. So you, you randomly draw row wise um, returns for all the assets. You optimize, then you, you say, so now you've got an optimal weight vector. Then you do this again and again and again, a thousand times. They've got a thousand just different optimal weight vectors that account for the true distribution of not just variances or, you know, covariances, coskewness and kurtosis, but also differences in means over time. And um, so, you know, you actually don't need to do this dimensionality reduction in the beginning where you're reading out assets. You can actually leave all the assets in there and then just re-sample the optimization process and take the average of all the optimal weights, which is kind of like, sort of like what, um, me show. He show does, but he uses yeah. the multivariate um, distribution and to, for resampling. And instead, you're just using an actual bootstrap of the empirical distribution. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll have to think more about that, too. Um, you know, I, I've steered clear. I guess I didn't really talk about much in the book, but I, I steered clear of sort of like the Michaud style resampling just because of the, the well-known issues of it, sort of like, you know, elevating sort of like you know, things that should be getting zero weight will have some kind of small average weight. And there, there's these like weird anomalies that happen when you. But it, but it is neat too, right? Because I, you actually do a great job. I love this about your book. You actually show the error terms in the, in the expected asset returns and then also in the weights. And you, so you see a lot of the time where the error bars are sort of between zero and 14% or between zero and 8% or whatever on, on some asset classes like commodities or on the, uh, long, short ARP strategy, right? And so, you know, you don't want it to be necessarily zero. You know, it could, you, you want it to be within this sort of error bar. And so this, th this way, actually, I mean, you're using the empirical distribution, you're giving asset classes, maybe they are just small weights, right? But you just, you, they are consistent with the true empirical distribution of what a, an investor might expect going forward and i just i love it because you're still capturing all the different moments of the of the utility function right so it's um anyway something to explore yeah okay cool i like it i like it yeah 
Um, so what, what do you hope to achieve with this book? Right. I mean, so, so obviously you've got this asset management business. Are you also building an advisory business or are you still only, um, focused on, on providing software consulting services to advisors? Yeah, the software, the software, you know, I want to give the software for free. And my wife said, no, the software is really, <laughs> is really, she cried a little bit too. Uh, and then asked me not to give it away for free. So yeah, I built it with my own money. And uh, I just, I really <laughs> didn't want to put another book out that, that was talking about empowering advisors and teaching advisors without actually letting them do it. I, you can't, they can't go code this stuff up. Um, right. And so I, I absolutely wanted to empower. That was really the goal. But I also wanted to modernize because things are starting to feel pretty stale from, from 1952. Uh, when long portfolio theory was invented. So, you know, my, my hope is to, uh, you know, get conversations like this happening, you know, see if risk lies emails you or I or whatever, see if we, you know, get any, anyone thinking there. And, you know, I just want to, I just want to sort of be pretty altruistic and I want to just help push things along. You know, I have a physicist view on this, you know, wealth management space, and I'm just trying to contribute to help you know move things forward and and empower advisors i i really don't like how um handcuffed advisors are in doing their doing in practicing their practice you know they just without the right tools and education um they they, they just can't do it and they just have to take you know these these big box asset allocation models or or whatever and so um yeah hopefully the the software will slowly evolve over time Hopefully we'll, um, you know, with ACS Ventures, we'll do a lot of good work on this behavioral data and how it factors into building portfolios in a smarter way and just get people talking about uh, some really important things. And just, you know, there's a lot of advisors out there who don't want to really be asset managers. They want to be relationship people. Um, so some of the heavy lifting stuff and sort of building customer portfolios, they won't be interested in but maybe the risk profiling and stuff like that, they, they will really still care about uh, because they want to really just, uh, you know, have great relationships with their clients and, and really build something that's good for them. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, it is, um, there's actually something in there for people, for, for planners and advisors with quite a wide spectrum of different um, foci, right? So, you, you, there is stuff in there for planners and we did um, skip over the section of the book that goes into the lifestyle risk yeah. preference yeah. or lifestyle yeah. risk. Um, standard of living risk. Standard of living risk. risk right. And, and right. And stuff. Yeah. Which I, I know all the planners are out there going, this is all great theoretical hocus pocus, but what about mm -hmm. clients with real goals? And I, I want to assure you that while this is not, I don't spend a lot of time on the planning side, but this is absolutely dealt with very um, coherently and work, comprehensively. I've work on the planning side and saving for retirement and all the risks associated with it. So, yeah, yeah, that's that was whatever Different seven, life. eight, ten years ago. But you're right; we do have we do have lots, and I just don't spend a lot of time on that these days. But but I just want to reassure planners who do focus more on the the hard sort of financial goals um, side of the planning exercise that there is some very concrete methods in the book on, on how to modify or moderate the, um, the utility function to accommodate very specific financial goals. And I think you do a good job of erring on the side of, um, if a client has enough risk capacity, that's when their preferences become important. But if they don't have the capacity to optimize on non-wealth maximizing preferences, then they actually can't play much of a role. So I, I thought that was very astute. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Michael Pompeian, for sort of motivating me on that. You know, his his book on on behavior and how to account for it sort of, um, you know, I basically took took a lot of his stuff, but just uh, change took one of his figures, changed the wealth wealth axis to SLR, just a slight change. But uh, but yeah, that's where a lot of that came from. Nice. Credit, credit where credit's due. Um, yeah. Having written a book and written lots of papers, uh, I know that the second it goes to, to publication that, you know, you start to think of things that you would have done a little differently. Uh, anything that you wish you had 
added to or or maybe said a little differently or just changed in the book? Thousand, thousand percent. Let me get out my scroll. <laughs> no, um, it actually hasn't been that bad thus far. Uh, there, there, there is one thing though. Uh, reflection was pretty new to me. And the way I parameterized it in the book is not going to be how it lives in perpetuity. So in the book, I parameterized reflection as just binary on or off, like you have yep. it or you don't. And the curvature, the amount of curvature in that sort of um, on the law side of things, that S-shaped curvature, I just use the, the risk aversion parameter as the curvature. And that's not accurate. And I've learned that with the work we've done with ACS Ventures on the testing. People... And now that I look back at other literature, I think the signs were there. Riskalyze knows this well. Uh, the, the reflection is very muted in a curvature way relative to the, the positive side. So there's a lot more curvature and risk aversion generally than there is in reflection. The reflection is kind of like flattish. It's, it's, it's really, it's kind of shallow. It's not that intense. Um, so just to assign the same amount of curvature if you're expressing reflection as you do on the positive side not so accurate so it you really need the same uh questionnaire as you do on risk aversion just kind of inverted for losses mm. and then you can just measure that parameter very very explicitly yeah there was a almost like a state change in the shape of the function when you add in the reflection which i thought was shocking in how and how much the utility, the shape of the utility curve changes. And the portfolios. And, and the, the portfolios, portfolios yeah, dramatic change. And equities. And so yeah. that's, that should have been my flag for, you know, before, before finalizing the publication. But no, I think that'll, that'll soften. So that's, right. like, I think, just an important lesson learned from the data. Yeah, out. absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Great. Well, listen, I really appreciate you. First of all, thanks for writing a book. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I definitely would recommend it for more um, quantitatively oriented planners and advisors. Um, there is a fair amount of, you know, technical material in the beginning. You do a really good job of, of sort of stepwise mapping it out and, and what the different terms are and why they're important and how they function. And certain terms are, are, are positive and certain terms are negative. And I, I think you did as good a job as you could have done with that. Um, there is a little bit of upfront uh, lift there in terms of, of the math. Yeah. Um, but for anybody who's remotely quantitatively minded or just wants to learn a little bit more about how to um, merge the, the twin concepts of maxim rational expectations and behavioral economics, I think you do a great job with that. And then lots of really good material to use in a bunch of different dimensions of your practice. Um, so thanks for writing it and thanks for coming on the show and explaining it and explaining your motivation and, and telling us a little bit about where you want to go with this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Anytime. All right. Awesome. We'll have a great afternoon and thanks for listening.